Thank you, Suhail. Does this work like this? Yeah? Um, this is a picture of a white cube um, that was inaugurated officially about two years ago um, on a former Unilever plantation in Congo. Um, and there's a strong claim behind this picture. And this is the claim. The only decolonized white cube is the repatriated white cube. I will go into detail. This is the location of this repatriated white cube, a white cube brought back to the plantations that have historically funded our white cubes. It is some 500, 540 kilometers east of Kinshasa, indeed in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, the location that you see marked <coughs> is the town historically called Leverville. It's now called Lusanga after the colonization names were changed. <coughs> Lusanga means confluence, Leverville means the city of Lord Lever. Lord Lever, who founded the Unilever business empire. Mm. Now, this Leverville was the central knot of a big plantation empire founded by Lord Lever in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Palm oil plantations are the most efficient way to produce fat. Before they started and mounted these plantations in Congo, they tried to do the same thing in Nigeria, but the British colonial government wouldn't allow Lord Lever to confiscate large tracts of land. The Belgian colonial government was fine with that, and so they offered, allowed Lord Lever to confiscate uh, um, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of hectares. Now, before and even during the, um, um, the founding of these plantations, the other uh, most profitable way to gain a lot of fat that one needs to make soap and margarine was whales. The whaling industry is in many ways equivalent to the plantation industry, and both lead to extermination and extinction. This is what a plantation looks like, an industrial palm oil plantation. Now, what is very specific about plantations, and they're not just in Congo, they're all around the Southern Hemisphere, is that only one type of human activity is permitted the type of human activity that leads to profit maximization, that leads to one single type of plant, the palm oil tree, that will grow the maximum amount of fat. And so, in effect, all types of other human behavior, the ones not conducive to profit maximization, all types of other plant behavior or animal behavior will be ruled out or exterminated. The most Violent form of that, of course, is known as slavery, in which, again, only one type of human activity is permitted and the other ones are wiped out, including choosing where you live and with whom you produce, uh, reproduce. So it's imposed monoculture on plants, people, and landscapes. Now, these monocultures have provided the profits that have led to the foundation of museums. Not just Tate Modern in London, obviously, the Tate Plantation Empires in the Caribbean, but also the Van Aver Museum in Eindhoven, the, the Ludwig Collections. Many of the big American universities have been founded with profits extracted from plantations. And somehow there's a real link between plantations and the monoculture that they impose and white cubes. Not only this link is financial, profits from plantations have funded, very literally, the uh, building of museums. There's also an ideological link. You could claim that both spaces are sterile. This is a picture of a white cube. It happens to be the gallery called the White Cube here in London. And what you see is that, indeed, it is sterile, with, you know, obviously very great advantages to it. It allows the artwork to be free from any political, economic, or social constraints one can appreciate the artwork on its own terms. Of course, that comes with a condition. Within the white cube, you can do, say, or think anything you like, provided that its effects will be only within that white cube. Within the white cube, you can proclaim communism, and it's fine, as long as it, as it doesn't really happen outside of the white cube. 
So it's a free space, it's a haven for critique, for love, for singularity, provided that it doesn't have real-world effects, or just a few real-world effects. The White Cube is a sanctuary for love, critique, and singularity, but outside of the White Cube, only capital accumulation is acceptable as a consequence of activities within the White Cube. This is Tate Modern. As I pointed out, Tate Modern, um, part of the Tate Museum Empire, and historically funded by the profits extracted from sugarcane plantations in the Caribbean. Um, a great white cube with indeed love, critique, and singularity um, in it, and a, a big part of the revival of London as a global city. Now, interestingly, there's been a lot of critique on big art institutions, including the Tate, how they gentrify. As I pointed out, the one type of effect that the white cube has in physical, material, social, economical reality around it is that it accumulates capital, that it made London a global city, that it allows for businesses to spring up and hotels to raise the prices, etc., etc. And of course, the poorer working classes or immigrants are then pushed out to ugly suburbs that they need to be bused to. So this is you know, obviously a lot of critique, and I think it has been also developed within this uh, course. Uh, a lot of critique has um, emerged against the white cube as a capital accumulator and indeed reinforcing class difference outside of the white cube, whereas inside the white cube you can say anything you like. Outside of the white cube, its main function is to make cities go up in the, in, the, in the global hierarchy of global cities. So gentrification certainly is something that happens, a reinforcement of class difference. However, this violence is peanuts compared to the global violence of the plantation system that has funded the white cube in the first place. Just as a tiny example, the Unilever series in Tate Modern um, was the most visited, the best visited art exhibition in the world, in the best visited art museum in the world between 2000 and 2012, was a major driver of the rise of London as a global city and was funded by Unilever and therefore by barely paid plantation labor in the global south, Unilever that has its headquarters just across the River Thames from Tate Modern. So the link is not between the plantation and the white cube is not just that both are sterile. The plantation is sterile, only one type of behavior is permitted. The white cube is sterile, anything can be done inside of it, provided that outside of the white cube it will have no other effect than just more visibility, more capital, and more legitimization for whatever system that white cube functions in. But the most important link between the two is probably that it is exactly the violence of the plantation system that one can need, that one needs to distance oneself from, that pushed plantation investors, such as Unilever and many others, to fund white cubes in the first place. Funding art here is a way to distance oneself from the violence elsewhere. There's a terrific book written on this by the Kenyan scholar Simon Gikandi, um, Slavery and the Culture of Taste, and it lays this out in historical terms uh, in a brilliant way, but it's still ongoing today. I'm, I'm very much part of that. I, I don't mean to single out Tino Segal here as the, the last, um, uh, as the last artist invited for the Unilever series. Um, he's, part in a, he's part of a, uh, you know, he's a fantastic artist, obviously. Other people that participated in the Unilever series were Bruce Nauman or Louise Bourgeois or Ai Weiwei or uh, Olafur Eliasson, all people with very strong positions against uh, global inequality or political violence or indeed in the case of Tino a, a very strong um, uh, take on, on dominant labor regimes and how that influences people's personal lives. So it was in terms of love, critique and singularity a fantastic exhibition and it was very great for London, this series, but it is also funded by a very violent system elsewhere on the globe. So I tried to kind of take responsibility for that to the degree that I could with this piece that Suhail mentioned briefly, um, the, the film uh, Enjoy Poverty. Um, it came out first in 2008, I changed it a little bit, and so in 2009 it was um, 
exhibited here in London, and I even think, no, I didn't come to Goldsmiths at the time. Anyway, so anyway, that, that film um, exhibits, if you will, that critical art dealing with economic inequality in the end generates more visibility, more capital, more legitimizations in the global centers of empire in cities like London. On the plantation, the film deals with plantation labor, with, with, um, with civil war, with uh, a white male artist, me, making a film about it. And what the film exhibits quite clearly is that in the end, I'll go home with a nice art piece. And indeed, it wasn't shown in New York and Berlin and here. And on the plantation, it had very little effect. I think this is true for 99% of all the critical art shown within museum or biennial context. So it was kind of an expose, an educational piece almost, on these power relationships. And it kind of brought me to the conclusion, also about my own work, that if art, on the one hand, critiques inequality, while, on the other hand, reinforcing class difference, simply by gentrification here in London, or by keeping people on plantations poor, they need to shut up and make $20 a month, and that's it. Whereas a different class of people can then elaborate nice pieces of art around it. That type of inequality, if art simply redoes that, reiterates it again and again, that's not critique at all. That's not critical art at all. That's trompe l'oeil art. It's pre-modern art that just paint some beautiful pictures on the wall. I mean, not just, the, the pictures can be beautiful. It's valid in and of itself, but it's not critical. So this, in my mind, is a dominant value chain of critical art. It starts with, you know, devastated natural environments and exhausted people. We have more and more of that. 40% of the global agricultural land is exhausted either now or in the next 10 years. In places like Indonesia, Papua, New, New Guinea, Malaysia, the land is it's up, it's finished. So Brazil, same story. It's, it's, and it has enormous consequences for the globe in terms of climate change and the extinction of species. So it starts with situations like that. And from that, of course, products are extracted, not just palm oil. The same goes for coffee for cocoa, um, for uh, uh, cotton that we need for our clothes. It goes for any number of minerals that are extracted from the same regions under the same conditions. And of course, profits are extracted from that. Again, a monocultural system. On a plantation, there is no way you can attend a lecture on critical art and what it's worth. Try it, you'll be expelled the next day. So that type of monoculture, it, it produces products and it produces profits. And then a part of those profits is reinvested in zones for love, critique, and singularity. In which then artists, they used to be white, now they can be black. That's great. But still, artists simply are put in a position where they can critique and make stories about love and, and have very particular positions of reflect on this apparatus. I'm now in that position. And that, in and of itself, leads to gentrification, a hipster economy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is all fine. This is all fine. If only there were a real connection between that new hipster economy and the plantation. And now there is none. There is no connection. You can buy fair trade products. It means that on the plantation you won't make one dollar a day, but one dollar and twenty cents per day. So if you have a headache, you can't buy an aspirin still, but maybe a quarter of an aspirin. That's kind of how far fair trade gets. And so if one looks at the position of these plantations, and if one, on the other hand, looks at the positioning of the most dominant white cubes, the ones that Eflux writes about, or that can buy um, uh, their part into Eflux news, new re newsreels, you see they're not on the same place. So I came to a simple conclusion. Um, I think that in the same way as an artist takes responsibility for the way his paint sits on a canvas, and whether it's this color or that color, whether you want the 
pain to go next to the canvas or stay on it and take this shape or that shape. I think in this day and age, we all know about global inequality. We all know of gentrification. We all know that these are the, the real world effects of art production. I then think it is the responsibility of the artist to decide where this gentrification happens, for whom and in what way to take responsibility for the capital accumulation that somehow always needs art, that somehow always needs art at its site. So the role of the artist is simply to take responsibility for her art. And the artist cannot allow capital accumulation produced through art to be managed by real estate investors or CEOs of big companies or politicians who decide where art should take place and where the profits will emerge and what type of regimes will be legitimized by it. That's for the artist to decide. So the first tiny attempt was, in a way, to work with people on the plantation. And I knew the plantations that, because I had been spending a few years on and around them while making this piece enjoy poverty, and simply try and find a way for these people to, be, to take the place of Andy Warhol, if you will. And so in Lusanga, this is Jeremy Mabiala, and behind him is Mathieu Kasiyama, and here you see, see a little bit of Cedrita Masala, all people who work on the plantation. Um, the main character, if you will, um, Jeremy has worked on a cocoa plantation all of his life, and behind him, Mathieu has fallen five times from a palm oil tree. They're very high. You climb with a rope, and then if the rope cuts, because you cut it with a machete, if, the rope, if somehow your machete hits the rope, then you fall, and he fell five times. That's an average. Here, they are working on a piece called The Art Collector. This sculpture on the left-hand side is made in, in dirt, out of dirt, out of clay, a mixture of clay and termites and sand, sculpted to represent what, in the mind of um, Jeremy, is an art collector, somebody who somehow profits from this apparatus, but also takes an interest in critiquing the apparatus at the same time. So it was really hard, if not to say impossible, for that piece to be exported from the plantation. You know, it's 540 kilometers from Kinshasa. It's a dirt road. The cars always break down every other minute. Uh, the piece will crumble, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, then there's export taxes and import taxes, and we scanned it. We scanned it with a 3D machine, and so this sculpture became a digital file. And this digital file was uploaded and downloaded and printed in 3D plastic things and reproduced in the end in chocolate coming from this and other similar plantations in Central Africa. The chocolate that we sourced in Amsterdam, which is where I live, and where there's also the, the biggest cocoa port in the world, just uh, a few hundred kilometers from here. So it was kind of a success. This was the first solo show of the Congolese Plantation Workers Art League, of whom the three people you just saw, uh, Cédric and uh, Jérémy and Mathieu, are founding members. So this was their first solo show at Sculpture Center, which is an interesting museum, maybe comparable to Whitechapel Art Gallery, something of the same uh, status in, in New York. And you see several of the sculptures. This is the self-portrait by Mathieu. In the middle, you see the self-portrait by Mbuku Kimpala. Um, and other pieces made by this collective, all reproduced in chocolate. Here is the art collector reproduced in chocolate. You also see the, the scan lines and the print lines. Behind the art collector is a piece by uh, Leba. Um, it is called A Poisonous Miracle. It's a portrait of his grandmother who is bitten by a chameleon. And the chameleon, according to uh, Leba stands for the ever sh shape-shifting forms of, of, of the global market. Whatever they were. First, his grandmother had to learn French, then convert religion, then send her kids to school, then get married in this way and not in the other way. Everything, every way, every value, let's put it that way, every Congolese value was changed 
in a very brief time period in order to accommodate global markets and produce on the plantation. And this Comedia on Shapeshifts, because now we're uh, 100 years down the line, um, Leba has no money. He has learned how to use money, but has no money. Um, he needs to learn French in school, but French is a language of oppression, mostly. And uh, the art that was made on the plantation is in the Met, the Metropolitan Museum, and it's in the Guggenheim collection. It's not on the plantation anymore. So the piece got very good reviews. The New York Times said it was one of the best shows of the year. There was also a lot of controversy because, you know, black people reproduced in chocolate, that's bad. And it is bad, maybe. But uh, some people said it was really brilliant. Um, and yet, we also felt highly unsatisfied. Um, it is true that Mathieu went to New York and uh, had a blast and was on the front page of the art section of the New York Times, but still, and yet again, people from the plantation, Mathieu in Casu, contributed once again to life in New York, not only through chocolate and cocoa and any of these other commodities, but now also with interesting ideas about chocolate, enriching life in New York. So the, the next best option, in a way, was to simply relocate the position of the white cube, if you will, the position of what Tate would be, or Sculpture Center, or Whitechapel. Simply bring it back to the plantations that have historically generated the capital that has funded these museums, these centers of legitimization, of visibility, and of capital accumulation. Simply bring that apparatus back to the plantation. So that was the next attempt, in a way. And I think the little image speaks for itself. And the white cube is always a problem. Generations upon generations of new curators decide what to do with the white cube. Such equally generations upon generations of artists have to think through what will I show in the white cube. And this is all very legitimate. It's great. It needs to be done. But it's also interesting to simply figure out, simply ask the question, what would a bunch of plantation workers do with the white cube? The repatriation of the white cube makes sure that plantation workers can decide what the white cube is, for whom it is, and what to do with it. So here we were building it. And you see... Um, it's, it's not a very big building. Um, it's some 120 square meters. And it's surrounded by this depleted plantation. It looks green. It looks great and fun. Um, pristine, in a way, but it's all depleted land. Uh, few things can still grow there after 100 years of plantation labor, and then late plantations, palm oil trees, and then later an impoverished population that does slash and burn agriculture on the land that remains. I know there's a lot of discussion about inclusivity and about art that should be horizontal rather than vertical, that should be based on the wishes and the needs and the demands of communities and um, marginalized populations. And I know many art exhibitions try and deal with that, with that demand for equality. I think the, the last documenta in 2017 in Kassel really tried to respond to that demand for more equality, for more inclusion, for more justice. The problem with the documenta, similar to the problem with Mathieu going to New York, is that in the end, all this new social, spiritual capital, I would almost show, uh, call it, accumulates where? In Kassel and a little bit in Athens not in Vietnam or wherever they found the artists to contribute to the big story of the last documenta. So I believe that if art truly wants to be horizontal, egalitarian, then the position of the white cube within these global value chains must be changed. For now, white cubes are all, always at the top of value chains. They're in the center of London. Or if they're in the outskirts of the city, they're still in rich areas. Hardly ever will one find a white cube in 
in a place where people are poor and are going to remain poor. And if it's put there, it's very strategically and deliberately put there in order to ac accumulate capital, visibility, and legitimization for whatever the apparatus is around it. So it seems the position of white cubes in global value chains must be changed. Here is the repatriation of art, not art from the collection of the Met, the historically stolen art pieces from that region, the Pende people who were uh, put in onto into forced labor regimes on the plantation, made magnificent art, art that inspired Picasso and the entire uh, birth of uh, that type of modernism. That art is uh, still in, secluded in collections, but their own chocolate sculptures that uh, were exported digitally, reproduced in chocolate, came back to the plantation. And that was a big event in a way. Here is Jeremy Mabiala, once again standing next to the art collector, uh, in the white cube, in Lusanga, the repatriated white cube, but now in chocolate. The white cube doesn't really stand there simply to be a symbolic act. It is that too. It has symbolic value. It is there to do, as any other white cube is meant to do, it's there to legitimize positions, in this case, position of plantation workers. It is there to attract capital and visibility. That, too, is not the end goal. The end goal is to create, by virtue of that white cube, of that legitimization apparatus, to create a new type of plantation, a plantation in the hands of plantation workers, defined by plantation workers, ecological, egalitarian, and worker-owned. We call it a post-plantation. And it's maybe important to note that this is a collaboration of two organizations. So as Suhail pointed out in the beginning, I'm part of this club called IHA, the Institute for Human Activities. I founded it a few years ago. And my only aim as an artist and as the artistic director of this institution is to make sure that critique on economic inequality is not merely trompe l'oeil, as I called it earlier. That critique on economic inequality is self-aware about its limitations. That would be the first step. But more importantly, that critique on economic inequality can actually redress that inequality. And so we work together with this Congolese Plantation Workers Art League, CATPC in French, the acronym. And they make art. Most of them were artists before I arrived in Leverville, Lusanga. But they united, formed a, uh, a cooperative. And through their art, they want to live better lives. They want to express themselves, obviously, like any other artist, and then improve their lives, up from $19 a month, let's say. And so together, the merger of these two programs, or the joint program, is to simply <coughs> buy back land from the heirs of Unilever and start these egalitarian e ecological post-plantations, fueled and even financed by art, financed by critique and therefore to do away with imposed monoculture. Critique becomes a way to seize the means of production. And critique, in this case, funds egalitarian, inclusive, ecological post-plantations owned by this group of plantation workers. They're a small club. At this point, there's 24 members. There are strong regulations in place and in the making to make sure we don't have 24 superstars, but it's shared amongst the, com the larger community. There's now a strategic alliance with uh, an organization called FOPACAM, that's the French acronym again, which has 150,000 members, half of them women, around and on the former Unilever plantation. So a strategic alliance to make art together, but also to buy land and start better ways of production that does not um, extract nutrients from the soil but regenerates it. Most people have zero capital. I mean, not a dollar. And so to invest in tools, to, in, in tools for better agriculture, to even invest in the grains for a mango tree that needs five years to grow before it gives mango, mangoes, people don't have that. It's really hand to mouth. So this is a useful alliance on the former Unilever plantation. This is a drawing by Sedaf Masala, one of the key members 
of CATPC. And his drawing kind of explains it all. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the plantation where people grow cocoa and palm oil. But there's also sculptures being made. And these sculptures then on this, I don't know what the word is in English, this magic tapestry, this magic carpet, are flown out to London, let's say. Also, the cocoa is shipped out. Capitalism takes care of it. We don't have to do that. It does it on its own. And then in, in the chocolate factories, obviously 99.99% .99 goes to you know, Cadbury's or Mars or what have you, the normal production lines. But a tiny, tiny percentage is used to make these sculptures. And the difference is huge. Not only do the sculptures allow or even force consumers to see what the opinions, the visions of people working on the plantation may be. That's interesting in and of itself. It also allows for a, a markup of 7,000% of income going back to the people producing the cocoa. I want to point that out. If, if fair trade is 20% more, Making art out of chocolate brings in 7,000% more. <clears throat> so art can really be useful. And I think in conclusion, we may say that so far, the plantation has been at the service of the white cube. Like it or not. Now, the white cube will be at the service of the post-plantation. And our aims are really high. There's now 65 hectares owned by CATPC. That's about 200 football fields owned by this group of 24 artists. But we strive to acquire 2,000 hectares, which is then 5,000 football fields, in the next three years. Because only then will we be able to make the argument to institutions such as the World Bank that it's way more useful to invest in worker-owned post-plantations than in these mono monoculture-imposing plantations that are currently getting hundreds of millions of dollars in European taxpayer, taxpayers' um, subsidies to create jobs in Africa. The companies now run in this monocultural model, $20 a month, are usually subsidized by British and European taxpayers. We want to make the point that the post-plantation, with its combination of income from agriculture and art, is economically equally viable as the monocultural model that exploits people and landscapes. And that this separation between plantations where people need to shut up and then other people, places where people can you know, talk, think, feel, that this separation is completely artificial. So that's the main point we want to prove, and we need to prove it in economic terms. So that's the plan for the next three years. And here is, I, I haven't actually met this lady, she's, she's one of the new interns at CATPC. People have an internship and then <coughs> if they make interesting art they're in, if they're not so great, they're out. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a couple of points further on than you presented here. Firstly, it's to do with the ownership structures of plantations now. So uh, I think you said in passing that uh, the land was being bought back from Unilever. But my understanding from previous conversations is Unilever divested from the plantations a while ago because they were politically and morally toxic. And part of the art washing they were doing through the Tate was an effort to decontaminate themselves from their colonial histories and sort of find a, a new, better Unilever. And they also have uh, a really strong corporate social responsibility ethos in the company. Uh, but the, comp the, the land is now owned by hedge funds, is that right? So what you're actually, so I was just wondering if you could like, elaborate a little bit more the subsidy model to the hedge fund as a kind of growth strategy for, for poorer countries, uh, and, then, and then your intervention in relationship to that, yeah. that model. Thank you. Um, so Unilever indeed divested from these plantations in 2010. So that, that's, they had already been funding 
the what you call art washing, washing program in Tate Modern for 10 years before they died, they sold their plantations in Congo. Um, and it should be said that these plant not the one where we work, um, Leverville was sold 10 years before that to a Congolese family. But four other Unilever plantations were operating for Unilever under Unilever management until 2010. And even up to this day, they produce the raw material for blue band. So they produce products that still have the Unilever brand on them, even if um, uh, Unilever tried to, to, to break a clear connection in the production and value chain. It's still very much there, because you can't produce a Unilever brand branded product without sending some of your profits to the headquarters here in London. So it's still very much in the service of Unilever. Um, now, these companies that bought it over, um, uh, indeed in 2010, they have access, because they're really great at spreadsheets, they have access to uh, tens, and in this case, $150 million in loans. Loans from the CDC, the British Development Bank, and various other European development banks. And so the mandate of these development banks is to combat poverty, create jobs in poor countries. Um, if one simply does the math, it's, it's really strange to invest $150 million in 6,000 barely paid jobs. That money disappears, and it does disappear. The shares, sorry, the loans are turned into shares, and then the shares have no market value. And the companies are based on the Cayman Islands. So that's basically all you need to know um, about where that money goes to. It wouldn't be so bad if, if, if life was fun on the plantation, but it's not. It's not fun. Um, and and I, I think we have a real opportunity to show that, um, as I pointed out earlier, that this, in my mind, uh, completely artificial separation between plantations, zones of extraction, zones where one needs to shut up because otherwise profits will go down on the one hand, and then on the other hand, zones where one is allowed or even um, uh, congratulated if one speaks out and you know, has critical positions about this, that, and the other thing. If these would be merged, as of course it was before Unilever set foot in these zones, if these would simply be merged, then I think you could have a more viable model, socially, artistically, but also economically. And so to, I wasn't quite clear on that, but th that is something we really want to prove, if you will, and that, so that's what we're working on now okay. with this post-plantation. And so in the end, I think CATPC, I don't own land in Congo, but I think CATPC would be completely entitled to get those loans, buy the land, which is their land in the end anyway, but buy their land and start this more fun, egalitarian art field, etc., and still produce palm oil, why not? But in a combination with also being allowed to produce critique on palm oil. Mm. That's the best business mix. So my question is going to be about your the terms of for engagement between you and CATCP. Uh, before I get to that, uh, just one more point of information, which I think people uh, who don't even practice wouldn't know from the presentation. If you could speak a little bit more about the franchising model. That, are you prepared to speak to sure. that? Yeah. If you could, so uh, in, at the opening of the White Cube, there was a discussion between the uh, people in the Congo and some plantation workers in Indonesia. Yeah. Um, and I think this generated some ideas for you and C CATCP, and I was wondering if you could just kind of speak about uh, what you're envisaging in, in that direction. It's still very much in the making, um, but indeed, uh, Congo obviously is not the only place, a place in the world with these types of realities. If only one would look where Unilever founded plantations, Congo is a small part of it. Uh, you have similar plantations in Indonesia and Malaysia and Brazil, and that's just one company. So this is a global phenomenon. Uh, the monoculture is a global phenomena. The extinction of animal species is a global phenomena, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also, it's a global phenomena that um, uh, white cubes are highly policed places. They're highly policed in who gets access to them. If you're an average plantation worker and you you have only flip flops, it's very hard to enter a museum and be part of the conversation. So um, I think we we're trying to overcome that problem by the repatriation of the white cube. But it, it, it's probably a good idea to, I wouldn't call it franchise it, but to, to build connections with other museums, with other white cubes. We have an OMA-designed 
So that's OMA is a very famous Dutch architecture firm uh, founded by, again, Koha. So they do, I don't know, all kinds of museums, the garage in Moscow, the, the Prada Foundation, etc. What I mean to say is we're on par with any other museum in the world in terms of how great the architect is. And so um, we can make connections with other white cubes, preferably in plantation zones, and use this network of white cubes to also create a network of plantation worker art clubs or art leagues. Um, because this works in Lusanga, I'm pretty much sure that if people put time and energy in it, it could work anywhere. It's not that you know, this room of people is indefinitely more talented than a room of people on a plantation. It, to be honest, there is absolutely no difference. And so to break that spell in a way, we're trying to set up a network of, um, through the existing network of white cubes, uh, create a network of um, uh, plantation worker art leagues. And then locally, for example, in Indonesia, by exhibiting in the art museum in Indonesia, um, involve the plantation worker art clubs from Java and, and other uh, well, islands of Indonesia, integrate them into the exhibition. We still have to figure out how exactly and create connections between those different plantation worker art groups, but also in each place between these art groups and their locally local white cubes that they otherwise would have no agency over or even access to. And so we're trying to build that up. And then, so the, the big plan is to, to have a global uh, art workers, plantation workers art show, um, probably in two, three years, which also with, with sculptures, of course, but also other artworks made by people in Lusanga, in Congo. Um, and interestingly, only after that, the exhibition should come to London, let's say. Only after it's been doing its work on the plantation should it come to here or back to New York. So you want to use the, the, the global infrastructures already placed yeah. in the art world and the kind of moral uh, prerogatives of the art system to, act, to, to open access, uh, both an exhibition but also um, engagement. Uh, with those institutions, yeah. and it's a kind of counter globalization, uh, but using existing infrastructures. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this, this this kind of brings me to the question I was going to ask you, which is um, so like privilege, and um, partly white privilege, which yeah. is something you get asked about a lot. And I want to just sort of ask you to speak to that because it's the question that always emerges, um, and I think we should head it, head it uh, tackle it head on, uh, but also maybe to speak about the privilege of. Um, your status. We had a talk last week about celebrity, mm. and it seems to me that this kind of um, uh, intervention and this kind of practice relies upon having a certain type of status mm. within the art system in order to kind of uh, get access to certain types of funders, open up doors in various museums, exhibitions. Uh, the status of having OMA, I mean, you mentioned a moment ago, it's quite important to have OMA who build other art museums to build your one because then that gives you the status for other people to be interested. Because you, then you belong to a certain uh, culture of prestige, let's say a celebrity culture almost, in the, in the kind of art system. Uh, and I'm quite interested in the same way that you're uh, using the material infrastructures of the art system to kind of develop this, this uh, counter movement from plantation workers. What, what seems to me um, kind of incisive about your practice is that you don't shy away from the privileges that you you have um, in order to kind of deploy them otherwise than to accumulate more privilege just for yourself because you're, you, the interest seems to be about distributing it, deploying it elsewhere. Yeah, well you bring up all the crucial questions for sure. There are others I'm sure. <clears throat> that... Yeah, no obviously I'm a, I'm a white male on top of that I'm you know, middle age, I'm 45 years old, I'm heterosexual. Um, so I take all those boxes. Um, and then I work with, you know, a star architect firm, and I told them, I think we need a white cube. Um, and would you make it for us? Would you draw it for us? And they said yes, because certainly they had heard of some things I had done before. And it was very deliberate and, and completely top-down on my part to say a white cube, not a bamboo shack. Mm -hmm. um, 
Bamboo shacks do not accumulate capital. That's why people build museums rather than bamboo shacks. And so if one thing is needed on a plantation, it's more capital, more visibility and more legitimization. And so the conclusion is simple, a white cube, not a bamboo shack. So I think it's, it's, um, it, it has a strong vertical component in that way. I am a white, male, Western European heterosexual man. OMA is uh, like 10 times more that. Um, at least 10. At least 10, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that's completely vertical. I think the verticality here is in service of a more inclusive, egalitarian, and ecological project, which is completely horizontal. But the horizontal project could not take place without the vertical aspects being strategically put in place. And I think this is, this is why, I don't, why, why I differentiate what this project is from what I call trompe l'oeil art, make-believe art. I think many art projects pretend to be or claim to be horizontal, inclusive, but can claim that only by leaving out of the equation the supporting apparatus of that art project. You can do something completely inclusive, but as soon as it's shown in any white cube, it is not inclusive anymore. It is built and based on exploitation, inequality, global apartheid. So in this case, I first of all think it's useful to employ that, these vertical power structures to make them visible, to make them knowable, to be able to reflect upon it, on it, critique it, what have you. So more knowledge creation, if you will. But it's also useful simple, simply in, in financial terms. And in, I mean, no, no land would have been bought back if it weren't for these sculptures being in New York in chocolate, given to us by a huge chocolate company that runs terrible plantations. And uh, no land would have been bought back if it weren't for the white cube standing there. And this image, or the previous image, being very readable as a white cube and not as a bamboo shack. So I don't think I have the full answer to your question, but I, I, as you already pointed out, I think since I am white, these are the cards I have. I am white, and I do um, come from Western Europe, and et cetera, et cetera, as most of you do. Um, and I'm simply trying to play these cards in the best way I can for a project that I think far I don't know what the word is in English, but far over, over, over classes. It's better, far, far, goes far beyond me being who I am. And in the end, you know, I'm going to die. I'm 45 years old. I'm not going to live forever. Uh, most CATPC members are younger than I am. Um, the White Cube has a kind of a life cycle of 100 years. So in the end, it's really other people will decide what to do with it. And they already do now, actually. There's a program, we call it the White Cube program. But also, goats are being stacked in the White Cube. And uh, you know, um, there's workshops on how to do agriculture in a better way. And then the soybeans are now inside of it, because it's the only place that has like a good roof on it, et cetera, et cetera. There all kinds of things happen with the White Cube that I could, have never, could never have imagined. And, uh, and I think that's a great contribution to art that I'm not making other people do that. OK. Questions? One at the back. Yeah. Two. I'm happy one to, one for you to. Yeah, one of us. Yeah, one of us. Maybe the most definite answer is, uh, I think the only decolonial white cube is the one that is repatriated. And um, all the other ones are, are whether they know it or not, are completely part of these dominant structures of oppression and segregation. Whatever program they run, even the program can be about love and critique and singularity, it doesn't matter. So that's, in my mind, a big achievement so far of this project, that it's 
that it tries to escape from that dominant circle and then produces things. In Casu, produces art being bought back, sorry, land being bought back. Thanks for your talk. Um, to me, I feel as if uh, we could really benefit from a white cube not being there. Um, specifically, like, I feel like it's an opportunity to kind of like create a different kind of art institution and like have influence from the kinds of art institutions that already exist there. I know that you said that like a white cube attracts profit, but like if you like worded it differently or packaged it differently. Like perhaps you could get funding for a different kind of design of an art institution. Like, did you try that beforehand, or like, how are you like so positive that? Because like to me, like I think it would be well worth a try to, at first at least, like not to have that design because that design just like is obviously so loaded and like in terms of gentrification, we think of like a fancy restaurant opening up in like a like a poor neighborhood and like aesthetic is like so important there, right? So like. I just think it would be a fantastic opportunity to build an art institution that isn't that doesn't have that like loaded design history. I think <clears throat> experiments are that are really useful, and I think you should do them. But in this case, we wanted a formula that has proven to work. But I mean, it, like it works in like Western like societies, and like this is like obviously a completely different situation, and this test has like never been done before, so it's like. A Well, I don't know. Yeah, I have a hard time answering. Uh, first of all, I think I don't understand why the white cube could be everywhere but not there. Um, these people have a direct connection with Tate Modern and the Lady Lever Gallery and, uh, and Tate Britain and what have you. A direct connection. So again, if any group of people should own manage a white cube, it is this group of people, so. But I mean like, sorry, I know there's like a lot of things I'm saying, but like a white cube is not everywhere. There's like art institutions and art groups and art community centers all over the world and they're completely differently designed. Like art, like white cubes exist in very specific places in the world that function with a lot of capital that are very westernized usually. Like art institutions exist all over the world in art groups and art centers. So is your, is your question about the conservatism of the white cube as a choice of art exhibition venue? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just like, I'm, I guess I'm just, I, I'm skeptical that it's absolutely necessary for funding, and I think that it's actually really damaging. And I think there's a potential to have a different kind, to, to support a different kind of art institution that would benefit the white cube, and that would benefit like cultural, like global art culture, um, so that we don't keep on propagating these white cubes because they're terrible. Like, what's what's the damage? Well, I mean the fact that all of the money that like is building these like places that are obsessed with like sanitized aesthetic and like complete control, like all of that money is coming from here, right? Like it's like a dirty. Sorry? Yeah, but I'm, I'm not quite sure if the critique is is worth it at this point. I think that I mean I you could I think that you could also argue that it would be a critique otherwise, but I just don't think that it's worth it. Well, if you want to talk about the white cube and and what the problems are with it, then then and I, I certainly want to do that. Maybe even in a very similar way that you do. But if you want to talk about a subject, then you should address the subject. And so the subject is the sterility of the white cube and the damage it does. And so in order to be able to talk about that, we need to point at it. Like, this is the white cube. And it's, it is the dominant model. Certainly, many people are trying to break that model, do other types of art practices, certainly. But it is the dominant model. And it's the model that's, at this point, still the best at attracting capital visibility and legitimize the apparatus around it. And so that is the model we want to deal with. We don't want to point at another alternative model, like that could be good or bad, or maybe it should be. No, we want to point at the main dominant structures and how to 
repurposed them, not an alternative purpose, sorry, an alternative structure that we may or may not be able to capitalize on. We really want to capitalize on whatever we have and repurpose it. So we need to point at the dominant thing, not at a nice alternative to it. Can I, can I take... So I'm just going to intervene on this, uh, maybe to, to clarify uh, how I'd understand it. So I think the issue would be that if, you're, if your ambition is to kind of bring capital as quickly as possible through the art mechanism to Lieberville or the Sangha, mm -hmm. as it's now called, uh, and to use this as a paradigm for other types of intervention, you kind of need something strategically that's going to bring capital quickly, and that's the white cube. If you try other types of spaces, it's not that they don't have legitimacy and so on, they just won't bring capital as fast and with as much visibility as the white cube does. So it's a kind of strategic play, not necessarily, uh, it's, it's a strategic play into connecting the interests of the plantation workers, renters practice, and people like us who look at things like that and have this kind of discussion, because that's the kind of discussion that does well in like our world and the magazines and the collectors and the rest of it. So it's 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 I guess I guess the the as I would understand it in the frame in the framework you've given, uh, the kinds of other types of spaces would be to use capital for what you're calling love, critique, and singularity, whereas you you seem to be reversing that and saying let's use the love, critique, singularity stuff in order to kind of bring capital as quickly as we can because the issue isn't about art in the end, right? the issue is about getting capital to these people so that they can construct the lives that they want to construct. And buy back the land. Yes, and buy back the land that was expropriated in order to build the Lady Lever Gallery. Yeah. Right, so, so it's a reversal, yeah. But I understand your critique, and it's very valid, certainly. Can you elaborate more on the, um, the capital that's actually brought in and how that's actually been used in changing the domestic society in there, because uh, to me, that sort of hyper-acceleration alludes to inflations and constructing, constructing more social issues for people that are not uh, situated within the arts environment, within the Congo, for example. Um, and also, I think with the idea of like, simply multiplying this formula that's worked at this one point, uh, 10 times or as many times, do you really think that will be successful? Because it may start to dilute. Um, so in terms of impact, um, it, it's been a long process. We started um, in 2012 on a uh, palm oil, another palm oil plantation still uh, owned by this hedge fund funded by the British Development Bank, still producing blue band for Unilever. And, um, we started there in 2012, and one year later, we were uh, pushed out uh, in a very violent way um, by the plantation company, direct orders from the city here. Uh, roads were blocked, uh, the drawings in which a group of uh, plantation workers uh, had defined their, uh, had defined the way they wanted to benefit from the program, how they saw their ideal village, how they saw art, um, uh, production benefiting to that, these drawings were confiscated by that company, taken away in a land cruiser. So that was the first impact. It was a very negative impact in a way because we, we had set up hopes with ourselves but most importantly with uh, uh, people working on the plantation and uh, the plantation company that thought that was, uh, yeah, there was too much value in it, if you will, and so they stopped the program. It is only after that that we went to uh, this second location um, where we can operate because it is no longer producing stuff for Unilever because it's kind of uh, already depleted. And so on this land um, live, uh, yeah, on and around this land live some 150,000 uh, people. Um, on the little village, the 20 hectares where we first started, there's around, in the beginning, 20, 30 people, and now there's around 100 people. And they all directly or indirectly live of, um, of art, uh, whether 
they were involved in building the white cube, or uh, in traveling and talking about it, or in producing uh, uh, sculptures, or in uh, working the land, or in managing the land, or in doing business administration. You know, uh, some in curating, some in acting and doing performances. All in all, if you include children and the elderly, there's some 200 people now living of this project. I must add, in very modest ways, um, um, I'm, yeah, I'm sad to say that it's still in very modest ways, but the reality is such that if somebody has $10 in her or his pocket, that um, some friend or neighbor or relative will come and say, look, I really have to go to the hospital because I have malaria, do you have $8 for me? And then so people give it. So money flows away quite easily because there's a 150,000 people around um, around the 200 people that somehow live on the project. So uh, I think the atmosphere is a lot more, it's a lot better. Uh, people are a lot happier than on these monoculture plantations. Um, absolutely much better, but it's very far away from what I would like it to become, and especially what CATPC would CATPC, Cercle d'Art des Travailleurs de Plantation Congolais, so this cooperative, what they want it to become. And I think the next step is to make it much, much, much larger. Um, I must also say that CATPC is becoming a very strong organization, and I'm kind of the, the core jester in a way. Um, I talk about it here, or I have fun ideas like let's do this, let's do that. But CATPC itself is run by René Ngongo, who's a, a terrific person. He found a Greenpeace in Congo in the midst of civil war. Uh, that's not an easy job. Um, he protects the organization against all kinds of internal and external uh, financial, uh, political, military pressures. Um, so there's real leadership there. And uh, there's a firm will of both CATPC and me, because my goal in the end is simply to prove that art that challenges economic inequality does not merely do that on a symbolic level, a show in a white cube. We've had that. I've seen it a million times. It's fun, but it's not good enough. So we merge those two goals in a way, and, and I think it, yeah, we need to become much bigger for it to really, really work. But can I can I stick my uh, I. Before, before the mic goes to the next question, I, I heard the question to be asking whether you'd um, thought about the consequences of like having a oh, sudden, right, a sudden right. boost of income to one part of the local economy and then other parts don't have it, and whether any of that's being modeled or thought through, um, not just in this occasion, but if you start thinking about it uh, as, a, as a kind of paradigm for other interventions. Yeah. <clears throat> It is certainly something that we, in practice, we have to deal with very much. I, I already gave the example. If somebody has ten dollars in her pockets, it, 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 it's very hard to keep capital because people are hungry. Um, in terms of the art market, um, novelty is an important issue. So we have to come up with new ideas every once in a while. But that's not too difficult. I mean, that's. That's the, the fate of every artist. Uh, you can do this type of work for a while, and then you have to invent something else, and that's just the way it goes. And hopefully, there will be enough people on board to have an ever ongoing spring, wellspring of new ideas. Um, even if we would work in other locations, obviously, we can't have everybody making chocolate sculptures and then think this will go on <coughs> indefinitely. But there's many other projects that emerge. Uh, some people now want to reproduce the clay sculptures in gold, thinking it will sell better. We'll do that. Uh, there's fiction films being made. There's a, a massive online open course that we're developing on plantations and white cubes that we would love to sell to. We don't only love, we will sell it um, to uh, all kinds of uh, universities. So there's all kinds of ideas springing up. And hopefully, we'll always have new ideas whenever the old ones uh, grow tired. Um, I want to return to the question that was asked, the first question, um, because it, I had a very similar sort of feeling about this work. Um, and it's 
And it's kind of, uh, I picked up on something that you said towards the end of the lecture where you were saying, and finally we can show that art can be useful. Um, and I want to like maybe put forward the claim that it feels like the white cube is being kind of treated as this universal equivalence for art, and that it's being not kind of treated as a kind of infrastructural form that in turn like determines how art can develop in different spaces, and that infrastructural form is very much a Western form. And even accepting like the pragmatic things that you're saying about how this kind of can help people in a situation within a given system that I, I guess like I, it would be fair to say you don't seem to be wanting to change with this work. Um, like the system itself, that is, you, you, you are kind of articulating a desire for mobility within that system, but not a change for that system itself. Um, would you consider it like, how, how do, you con do you consider it a trade off um, that this might create then a disposition towards making art and in turn a way that people kind of structure a way of life that, is, like, that includes art in a way that is? like in, in a sense alienating or quite western in its origins like thinking of art as a, like a thing that has to exist within this discrete space rather than like in spaces that are alternative to like the white cube form of infrastructure um and i kind of wanted to ask like also what why this uh, project isn't framed as being art right so like or i mean maybe ask more do you see this as being something that is art your intervention um because you, you've made a claim that in order to be useful uh, an artist ought to maybe like try and find the way in which they can feel or can act in the least morally reprehensible way, um, given that we are implicated in all of these like uh, like structural problems. Um, but even then, when you're constructing this white cube in this space, it feels like you're trying to contrive a way in order to like be the most moral person that you can be in this situation, which may not even be the best possible thing to do. And, yeah, and I, I'm sorry, like, I'm, I'm sure... I can't take like, more, I'm sorry. So if you have more, then that's, leave. That, that's yeah. it, I'll leave it there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you're, you're welcome to come back, uh, of There's course. Two, two questions. On the... Yeah, yeah. Um, well, certainly I don't want to limit art uh, and the life of art to what happens in the white cube. Um, the sterilized, I don't know what words you used, but... No, the whole goal is to build this post-plantation, a plantation that is no longer based on monoculture, in which art and critique and love and beauty and singularity are all part of normal life. So I don't think the post-plantation is going to be located within the 120 square meters of the white cube. Quite the contrary. The white cube, by its strategic positioning on that exhausted piece of land, will be able, I hope and I think, to turn around this depleted land into this post-plantation. So the art happens around the white cube, not inside the white cube, but outside the white cube. However, we do need the white cube as a, rep a point of reference, a point of all the pragmatic issues that we mentioned before. As a point of reference to this pragmatic issue, but also as a point of reference to point back at all the other white cubes, including the one we're now sitting in, by the way. This is, in many respects, a white cube, a place where discussions debates like this can happen. So I, again, do not understand why one would want to reserve these conditions only to, I don't know, what is it, the, the lecture hall of, of Goldsmiths University. It should be everywhere, but everywhere for, of course, for people to take ownership themselves. Maybe the, debate, the debates will be completely different. Maybe the chairs will be burned. I don't care. Anything. But uh, maybe the chairs will be taken outside and turned into, into fertilizer to grow better plants. I, it really, anything is possible. Um, what I mean to say is, indeed, this more inclusive egalitarian project fueled by art is outside of the white cube. And so I think this, these concerns that you, that you have are the very basis of why we built the white cube there, in order to make this post-plantation uh, possible. What was the second question? It was about why the artwork is. Oh, the artwork is everywhere. Yeah, it's, um, it's everywhere. It's, um, it's the white cube itself is a piece, I guess. It's designed by OMA, but um, 
Yeah, it's a piece. It, it actually doesn't really matter what is inside a white cube. What matters is what is outside the white cube. And what is outside the white cube is partially created by the white cube being there. So in and of itself, it's a piece. Now, the post-plantation in itself could be a piece. And of course, the sculptures are pieces, as are the films. and the, um, They're all pieces. Uh, maybe the whole thing is one giant performance, but the performance that people can actually live off, which is very different than from unperformed plantation labor. You can't live off that. The $19 per month is a status quo. That's a status quo that we now inhabit. You inhabit it as much as I do, as plantation workers in Congo, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, Guatemala. That's the status quo. And so in order to rethink it and reorganize it with effects, um, yeah, we need to try out a few things. And this is one attempt. I'm not saying it's the best one ever, but it's a real attempt. All right, there's three, three more questions. One, two, and three. So take it down. Um, I was trying to find <coughs> some kind of you know gap in 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 the lecture, or you know kind of try to kind of criticize or find a, an angle of what your trade off might be of this project, etc. But actually, um, I'm bouncing it back at us, and I wanted to ask you, what do you think the position of the art college is in the matrix? Because you know this is a system itself that belongs to that matrix. Yet in that matrix. The art college wasn't there, so I'm wondering, yeah, where would you like to position it in terms of that power matrix that is was really well designed? Um, yeah, just that. You don't mean the matrix. You mean <laughs> not, we're not red pilling anyone here. power matrix. No, that one. Okay. There. Yeah, yeah, not the matrix. <laughs> well, that matrix, indeed, or that that value chain, was was very very schematically and very bluntly uh, uh, designed. Um, and I, I guess the, the art colleges are, are uh, through taxes and are, are just in front of the museums. Here the people are, uh, by a vicious system, selected uh, for it's not that participation vicious. in it's the white not, cube. It's not that vicious. It's just well, it's vicious that in the way that people have loans to repay and stuff like that. And only, you know, more and more only, I mean, I, I don't think I would have made the, the jump, the, 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 took the risk in the, in the 90s when I went to art school. I, I wouldn't have been able to afford it. And maybe I would have just studied business administration and uh, something else. So I think it's, it's, it's complicated, the position that students are in these days. But anyway, it, it belongs there. It's between the industry and the, and the white cube, I guess. Um, I, I'm really in favor of letting a, a thousand flowers bloom. So um, if you have plans to do something significant that can change the world and you can pick up some ideas here, then I, I would really support you. It's a total non-answer, but this kind of... Hi, is that lovely? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to go back to your suggestion that there's a never-ending wellspring of ideas in this artistic community. To kind of to counter that with the, um, I don't know, the provocation that this project is trading a lot in success in the capital accumulation for, for these artists or these artworks, trades on your own profile and, and kind of cultural capital and networks. So I was wondering what your mechanisms are for ensuring that future exhibitions secure a similar level of economic capital. Might this be like a methodology for training members of the community to extract, extract Western art capital? I don't know, PR jobs, um, network computers, gallerists, photographers, photographs and artworks. How can they do this without you? And, and kind of going on from that, um, why set up plantations, or obviously not only at this one, but if you were to expand the model, doesn't that immediately decrease the value of the exported artworks? Um, and would you then suggest that other artists should become patrons of similar projects or initiatives, and then or in another near closing cycle? <laughs> Just wondered if you have comments on all of that. Mm. 
The latter is indeed provocative, another colonial cycle here. Yeah. If all of you start post plantations and collaboration work, plantation worker art groups, and then Suhail can be the mastermind. <laughs> I'm going to retire on the profits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the wellspring of ideas. The show in New York was, I, I mean, it was named and labeled after Cercle d'Art et Travail de Plantation Congolaise. And um, if I was mentioned in articles, that was really decreasing the value of, uh, of the work, because then people would make your argument. Uh, it's only great because there's Renzo's guys involved, and that, that then certainly then the art wasn't appreciated as much. In articles that were really on the show and on the work, and yeah, these people really loved it, because there's so much to love also, it's, they're, they're really fantastic pieces. I can't really speak to them so much because I'm not a curator nor an art critic, I'm an artist, and I find it hard to speak about other people's work in a, in a really good way. Um, and so I also can't work, speak so well to the art of CATPC. But um, I think it's really fantastic work. So I don't think it forever needs me. Also my art capital, contrary to what you may believe, is or that you seem to believe isn't that big. It's, it's really the program that is, uh, yeah, that, that seems to work out. Um, and of course, we're, by buying back means of production, or bringing them back, first of all, the white cubism is one means of production, but in the end, simply the land, buying it back, this, this also produces uh, income through agriculture. There's even schemes to now grow uh, acacia trees and become a, a carbon pit. There's many iterations or new ideas through which uh, bringing back the means of production in the hands of plantation workers can become an entire portfolio of income sources. Um, mostly poor people or impoverished people don't have, even if they occupy the land, they don't have um, they don't have a land titles, they, they have no access. You can't go into the office of the land ownership or bureau in Kinshasa on flip-flops. You're not even going to enter the door. So simply being able to buy shoes and a suit is quite helpful. You can get the title to your land. Um, I know this sounds horrendous. Why would people not be able to be do on flip-flops? It's The world is a very vertical place. It's a very set class segregated, racially segregated world that we habits. And so the reality is on flip-flops you won't get a title to your land. If you have leather shoes, you will. So buy leather shoes. And if you can do it through making some art pieces, that's, that seems to work. And the, true, the same is true for all these other things you mentioned. Uh, uh, making photographs and uh, um, uh, mounting <coughs> exhibitions. Say that uh, one of the other members was invited to a conference organized by Oxford in Tokyo speaking on repatriation. Uh, not of stolen artworks, but repatriation, or not only of stolen artworks, but how <coughs> how you wouldn't want anything repatriated if it would end up simply in private collections of wealthy Congolese businessmen, or in um, in a national museum that indeed he would not have access to because it's far away and there's a dress code that he can't adhere to. So anyway, it's it's it starts to work a little bit with. Uh, all these different roles being occupied by CATPC members and being changed also. Now, in terms of the last question, whether the value of the art pieces would dilute, yeah, maybe. We don't know. It, 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 I mean, is the value of art work here at Goldsmiths going to dilute because there's too many brilliant students here? Probably. Would you then have to like kick okay. half of them out because otherwise the value of the other half will decrease? Yeah, maybe. But I don't know. I think like we know that it's not the, the fact of producing art that gives it value or really whether it's better or worse because there's no system for judging kind of in terms of the content of an artwork what should make it more or less valuable and I mean what we talk about almost every week is the fact that there's no direct link between or way to know what the value of an artwork should be that's why we don't artists here don't know how they will make money out of their practice so I feel that you're dodging the question of what gives this artwork value. 
Yes, I'm dodging that question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a magical trick. <laughs> oh, come on, Renzo. Come on. No, it, is, it, okay. it really is. <laughs> Uploading, downloading. I mean, you've seen it. It's a, it's a magical carpet. <laughs> this, this. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was really interested in the way that you describe the structure as um, containing, I suppose, both vertical and horizontal aspects to it. Um, and I was thinking about vertical aspects and whether they are something more akin to a pillar or some kind of prop and what that would be propping up, um, whether that would be propping up the more horizontal aspects of the structure, or whether it would also, or whether, and whether it would also be then propping up the the sort of verticality of the or of the problems of the uh, structure that you're trying to kind of um, take money from, essentially. But the other the other verticality that I was thinking it could be is something more like a leak or a drain. Um, and I suppose a leak or a drain from something is very quickly plugged up. So I was, I was wondering then about the sustainability of this verticality of the structure, which you say needs something horizontal and needs something vertical, and whether you see that it needs to be sustained, or whether it can in some way drain something and then be cut off, and it isn't necessary to have a vertical element anymore. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's metaphysics, huh? Metaphysics. It's um, metaphorical metaphysics. <coughs> Join the microphone. Um, yeah. So the, the, the vertical pillar is a drain? Uh, like a sewer, standing upright? Yeah. Is it a pillar, or is it a drain, or is it both? And does it need to stay there? I mean, if, if and when a lot of land would be bought back and we have made the claim to uh, successfully to, for example, these big funding institutions for big investments to happen not in privately owned companies that impose monoculture but in worker-owned post-plantations, if we can make that claim, maybe that's, an, again, a very vertical activity, of course, to fly to New York and make the case, nevertheless. If we are able to do that, then, yeah, I guess then, then we would have a really good head start to make it work without further, um, without, without needing further horizontal, sorry, vertical um, support or what have you. But I, I think in my mind, any dollar that goes from here to there to the plantation is perfect. I mean, I don't even care so much um, what the exact scheme was. If it works, it works. And so, I'm an artist, you know, I didn't study business administration after all, so I only have artistic means that I can use. I think artists should take responsibility, control over white cubes, and so that's what I'm trying to do. I don't have other means, really. Um, it kind of hits also the question of like sustainability, or mm. I think how they, these uh, white cubes are continued to live, because you mentioned that they started using it for uh, drying uh, soybeans, or so is in a way like, I think my question is a bit like how is the use of the white cube as a white cube, is it, does it start off with, we put the white cube here to have kind of like this uh, attention, saying like mm. attention within the project uh, you started, and then the structures, let's say, le left left to them to use it as they want, and if they want to use it as a white cube to make exhibitions, they do it. Otherwise, they just start using it as a as a building that is dry and provides land, so they can use it. So, I think that's a bit my question. Where it's like, how do they communicate the white cube and like promote it after? the start and maybe the, the international recognition that uh, it started there and then it just goes on, it's like a building. Yeah, the process hasn't come to a conclusion, it's ongoing.
So there's a um, part of it is drying the soybeans, but uh, other parts are workshops. Other parts are exhibitions that will take place. Um, it's other parts of it figuring or featuring in fiction films. It's going to happen. Um, and video clips, all kinds of stuff. It, it, the process has not ended. It's not, we're not there yet. We don't have these 2,000 of hectares of land yet. Um, so it still has to perform its function as a white cube. Maybe, I, I pointed out, I, you know, life is not, I mean, the physical life, at least, is not eternal. So certainly at some point I won't be able to um, help out anymore or think it through, and then certainly other people will do it. Yeah, and even now, other people do it. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have a firm answer. It's uh, it's kind of there's two organizations, and together we we run this whole program. And the White Cube is one strategic element building within that joint program. And so it's, the White Cube sometimes is is what any other White Cube here would be, and sometimes it's something else. And, and that's also why it's so beautiful that sometimes it takes other forms. This, this is the last question of the year. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, very good one. Um, so you said that uh, you, know, you highlighted how critique is stuck in this vicious cycle of passivity uh, that it doesn't produce practical results, at least in its current state with a large world the way critique operates. Um, so would you see what you're doing as more or less a call to abolish critique? Mm. Or would you say that it is actually taking critique to its final stages, to its conclusions, and therefore does it have critique as one of its foundational pillars? If so, could there be a division of labor between those who critique and those who take direct action? Or does each intervention have to tie back its own loose ends and has to tie back its own circle? As it is that inclined. Thank you. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think critique is, is great. Um, uh, it's very necessary. The, the, the problem with critique is that often it's, uh, it's not producing anything other than nice exhibitions. Uh, we're talking about artistic critique here. And so this is one attempt to make sure that critique actually does its work, that's all. Um, you know, these people can't live off plantation labor, and so the attempt is for critique on plantation labor to, to be enough to make a living off. Um, that's certainly how it started. And I think gradually, CATPC, if, if you're part of the workshops, It, it seems people don't want to criticize so much anymore. They want to build. So <clears throat> the new sculptures, there was a workshop last month, and then there's new ones. There seem to be more about envisioning what the future should be or could be. And the sculptures are more like a, a currency, quite literally also, to produce that new future, that post-plantation. So, so maybe also in my understanding, um, I, I, I always saw it as some kind of an applied institutional critique, critique institutional critique that actually produces alternatives. Um, but it, it, it turns out that many of the CATPC members really aren't so interested in critique. They're more interested in, in imagining new futures and then building them. And I think that's perfect, yeah. Um, so the division of labor between those critiquing and then those doing the, f the manual labor. Yeah, if people who do manual labor are really fed up and they can make good sculptures about it or something, that was, you know, that works. Um, uh, the, the whole project is about really um, overcoming that division, not in, in a global way. Um, because I felt like a fraud in a way. I felt like a fraud when I made Enjoy Poverty, and I luckily knew that it was going to be a fraudulent piece. I luckily pre, I, I understood well in advance 
that me making a critical piece about economic inequality, while my entire life has been sustained by that very same inequality, that critique is sterile before I can even utter it. And so this entire thing is an attempt to overcome that. Um, so I, I must admit it's also for my own sanity that I try and do this. Um, just, just as a kind of conclu co concluding couple of notes, it seems to me uh, through the questions and your responses, there's a couple of, uh, it's a bit like the practice is on a pivot or it sort of switches in two ways. So I think some of the earlier questions seem to be very much about, uh, you know, there's a kind of critique, there's a there's kind of decolonial movement within the universities systems in the global north. Um, and so that sort of argument would contest like the power structures of a room like this, people like us talking up here, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but what seems puzzling from that perspective of what you're doing is you want to reinstitute those kind of old forms of power within mm -hmm. a new situation. That seems, that seems uh, kind of, and so, so this, but also you're, you're dedicated to redressing some of the effects of colonialism in a very direct um, and I think around the questions more recently, it seems to me that one of the ways you could characterize it is that there's a real challenge in, in what uh, the whole practice is. Um, um, the artwork is not so much the result of a process, but it's a mediator in a larger system mm. of engagements. And that, that seems to be a real, a real challenge to how we normally attend to artworks through, yeah. through essentially traditions coming out of modernity and to contemporary art where the artwork is the culmination or the, the sort of final, final thing. Um, but in a way, you're taking the reality of the art system, which the artwork circulates as part of a mechanism or an infrastructure, uh, and you're trying to politicize that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I try to politicize that. And I want to point out that the, 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 the decolonial movement in the universities and art centers of the global north functions exactly along the very long white cube lines. It, 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 it's very necessary and I adhere to it. And at the same time, it, the, the power structures remain, the, 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 the financial structures, the infrastructures of where white cubes are, as I pointed out, and how they operate, who's included, who's excluded. If you look at it through the eyes of class, nothing is changing. And so I think this project is, is in a way an attempt to, to, push, to push that agenda of decolonizing the apparatus further than, than what is mostly done. Mm. The entire apparatus. I can't speak to that so well because I don't understand it myself, but intuitively that's what I try and do. All right, thank you, Renzo. Um